My name is Jacqueline Yant. I am a specialist in radiation, ionizing radiation. I spent 21 years on the faculty at MIT in the Nuclear Science and Engineering Department. I did a lot of teaching about radiation, um, also radiation biology, radiation production, radiation health effects, and uh, this is a subject I really love. Uh, the talk that I gave at this conference was called The Importance of Radiation Dose Rate, and it's my opinion that we um, focus a lot on dose, whereas what we should be focusing on is dose rate, particularly in the dose rate range that we need to worry about when we're faced with the possibility of a contaminated environment. Most of our understanding about the health effects of radiation come from the A-bomb survivor study. That is our biggest, most general population, and it has been studied very, very deeply for many, many decades. The dose rate to the people in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, however, uh, was very, very high. All of the dose that the, that the survivors received um, came in about two seconds. And so that's a very, very big dose rate. And in fact, it's a million, 10 million, 100 million times what we see at background. Whereas when we're making a decision as to whether or not to leave an environment, for instance, the 20 millisieverts per year that the Fukushima residents um, used as a trigger for when they evacuated, um, that's only eight times background. And so the big question is, how do we take what we know about the A-bomb survivors when they got irradiated at a dose 10 million times background? How do we take that information and make it uh, useful for us when we're trying to make these difficult decisions about leaving our homes, leaving our communities, leaving our towns, um, breaking families apart as we've seen in the Fukushima situation. So that's the big question. The way we do that is to use something called the dose rate effectiveness factor. We take the risk from the, uh, that we, the risk of radiation that we calculate from the A-bomb survivor study, divide that by some number, and then we say, okay, that's the risk from low dose rate radiation. I, I see two problems with our, the approach that we're taking. One of them is that we use only a single number for that dose rate effectiveness factor. Uh, we, regardless of what the low dose rate is, we correct for the fact that it's lower by simply using a single number. And that number is another thing I have a problem with. So the seminal document that describes the dose rate effect was, was written by the NCRP in 1980. This is NCRP 64. This has remained the most important uh, reference for um, choosing the dose rate effectiveness factor. Now, it's important to note that NCRP 64 separated low dose rate effects into two categories. One category they called protraction, and that was a situation in which an animal was irradiated for most of their lifetime at low dose, at relatively low dose rates. Um, the experimental studies are all carried out still a few orders of magnitude, maybe a thousand times, sometimes 10,000 times higher than background, but they're still uh, maybe a thousand times lower than the A-bomb survivor data. So they're still looking at the sparing effect of low dose rates, but the low dose rates they investigated were still very high. Now, they looked at protraction, in which case the animal is subjected to radiation for a big chunk of their lifetime, this allows not just for DNA repair to take place, but also changes in susceptibility to tumorigenesis, um, adaptation to the radiation, all sorts of um, physiological responses um, get taken into consideration. They, they distinguish that protraction effect from a true dose rate effect, which is a much shorter duration of radiation, not taking into consideration any changes in the whole organism over time, such as radioadaptation or changes in susceptibility, that kind of thing, but only considering the effect of DNA repair. Now, when they looked at that true dose rate effect, they find values of the dose rate effectiveness factor from about uh, a little bit over one to as much as 10. And they recommended, um, uh, most of the values were around two to seven, eight, nine, 10. NCRP recommended using values of two to 10, but all agencies since then have chosen to use a value of either 2 or 1.5. And in some cases, there are explicit explanations um, as to why they're using a low number, and namely to be uh, conservative. 
Now this strategy has been used and implemented for uh, coming up with standards for radiation workers. Now I think that is an inappropriate uh, value of the dose rate effectiveness factor for the situation when the dose rate's really quite low, a handful of multiples or 10 times background, maybe even up to 100, 200 times background. In that case, we should be using something closer to those protraction factors, which when they were looked at by the NCRP, range from 6.6 .6 to over 12, uh, with an average of about 10. When the NCRP looked at even lower dose rates than they looked at in protraction factors, they couldn't find any increase in tumorigenesis they couldn't find any decrease in lifespan. In fact, they found the opposite. They found increases in longevity. Um, they make it very clear that at quite low dose rates, still above background, many multiples of background, you get, in many animal models, increased longevity, probably due to some kind of uh, systemic stimulation that the low-dose radiation um, is doing to the organism. So just to, just to summarize this, I, I think that we are when we're looking at low dose rates and we're looking at the problem of a contaminated environment, we need to do away with all of our conservative assumptions and we need to provide the most accurate data we can. And by using a DREF, a dose rate effectiveness factor of only two, we are diluting the accuracy of the data that were reported in NCRP 64. And we are basically doing a disservice to the population that has to make a decision as to when to evacuate. Is it eight times background, or could we stay to perhaps 10, 20, 50 times background? So I, I would like to just conclude by making a couple of recommendations. Um, I think it's important that we uh, consider using more than one value of the dose rate effectiveness factor. When the uh, dose rate is really quite low and people are exposed to uh, radiation for substantial periods of time, um, much longer than needed for DNA repair, long enough for these uh, systemic changes in susceptibility, for instance, we need to use a number more appropriate to protraction, in which case uh, the risk estimates would fall perhaps by a factor of five from what we're using now. And that would be of enormous benefit, um, be more accurate and be highly beneficial to people having to make the decision of whether to stay or whether or not to stay. I also believe that in the dose rate regime of interest to this, uh, to my discussion here, uh, contaminated environment, when to stay, when to go, it is not the total cumulative dose that's the important issue, it's the dose rate that the individual is experiencing. And the reason I say that is because you can elicit a certain response in an organism at a given dose delivered acutely, but if you reduce the dose rate, you can completely eliminate that negative effect, and that's been seen experimentally many times. And I really believe that we need to generate radiation risk estimates specific for the um, condition, the, specific for the situation of a contaminated environment. In this case, we would be eliminating many of the conservative assumptions that seem more appropriate for radiation in the workplace scenarios. And in addition, we would um, choose dose rate effectiveness factors that data show are much higher than the uh, values we're using right now, values of 2 or 1.5.